this week on the All-American Legacy Podcast. Throughout our 100 years, Sergeant Alvin York has been our most prominent national hero. In fact, his story is in some ways bigger than the 82nd Airborne Division. The Germans met our charge across the valley with a regular sleet storm of bullets. I'm telling you, that there valley was a death trap. The Lost Battalion was surrounded for five days, and, and how they got in this position is another long fog of war story, but suffice to say that the Lost Battalion had no chance to fight their way out. This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All-American Legacy Podcast, an inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are All-American all the way. conspicuous gallantry beyond the call of duty, you have been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Sergeant York, I am proud that you are of the All-American Division. It's a privilege to command such men as you. That's a scene from the 1941 movie Sergeant York. In that scene, Major General George Duncan, commander of the 82nd Airborne Division, presents Sergeant Alvin York with the Distinguished Service Cross. At the 14th Academy Awards that year, Gary Cooper won the Best Actor Oscar for his portrayal of the 82nd Infantry Division's Sergeant Alvin York. Welcome to this edition of the All-American Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Master Sergeant Patrick Malone. Throughout our 100 years, Sergeant Alvin York has been our most prominent national hero. In fact, his story is in some ways bigger than the 82nd Airborne Division. His is the story of the pacifist forced to take on dozens of German machine guns and capture more than 100 German soldiers and then refuse to profit from his fame. There are buildings, trails, institutes, foundations, awards in Europe and all over the United States named after Sergeant Alvin York. There are books, many books, trust us. We've read an awful lot of them. And of course, the Gary Cooper movie. Alvin York did not want to be in the 82nd. He did not want to be in the Army at all. He was an outcast within the All-American Division with few friends. Unlike his fellow All-Americans, he didn't drink, he didn't chase women, and he didn't support the war. During World War I, the 82nd was a true representation of America. They were a diverse group of backgrounds and ethnicities, and Alvin had never left the mountains of Tennessee. We are dedicating two full episodes to the story of Alvin York. They're titled An Army of One because that really captures the core of the Alvin York story and not just in the Argonne Forest on October 8, 1918. He was guided by his own notion of right and wrong before and after the war. He tried to escape service in World War I before the war and after the war he tried to escape the fame his heroism brought on. He isolated himself from much of the country after the war turning down a fortune in advertisements, interviews, and speaking engagements. One of the things we're finding in developing this podcast is that the full spectrum of the post-industrial American story is manifested in the history of the All-American Division. That really is true in the story of York. York was an outcast, but he is a product of a particular part of post-colonial America. The turns he took, the characters within Alvin, each have a story to tell of their own. He is, in fact, many faces of America. Early on in life, he was a violent drunk. Later, he found Christ and became a pacifist. As a pacifist, he became a machine of war. Then he became a community organizer and a proponent for educational opportunities in Tennessee. He would later become an icon with the Gary Cooper film and an advocate for American entry into World War II, the very war that launched our division's airborne legacy. At the age of 54, York actually tried to enlist in the army to fight, but was denied because he was overweight and in poor health. Alvin York may not seem like a typical All-American, but his story is America. In these two episodes, we'll also cover the controversy and doubt that surrounded York's story for almost 85 years, 
until the Sergeant York Discovery Expedition settled the matter of exactly what happened in that dark forest that October day. Spoiler alert, the official story, it turns out, is true. I'll give fair warning to all here, there is no way to tell the story of Alvin York without repeatedly talking about his faith. Alvin's religious beliefs are an important part of everything we'll talk about in today's episode and, in telling an honest, complete account of the story, we cannot get around it. This story is in five acts. We'll start with Act 1, Day of Days, where we'll let Colonel Mastriano tell the real story of what happened in that French forest 99 years ago. In Act 2, Paul Mall, we'll examine the pre-war life of Alvin York and how his faith and his father shaped October 8, 1918. That will do it for this episode. In next week's podcast, we'll cover Act 3, Reluctant Hero, where we'll follow Alvin York's post-war life. In Act 4, Legend, we'll take a look at York's advocacy for World War II and how skeptics and revisionists distorted the York story. Finally, in Act 5, The All-American, we'll take a close look at how Sergeant York remains part of the 82nd Airborne Division bloodline. Act 1, Day of Days. The Germans met our charge across the valley with a regular sleet storm of bullets. I'm telling you, that there valley was a death trap. It was a triangular shaped valley with steep ridges covered with brush and swarming with machine guns on all sides. I guess our two waves got about halfway across and then just couldn't get no further no how. The Germans done got us, and they done got us right smart. They just stopped us in our tracks. Their machine guns were up there on the heights, overlooking us and well hidden. And we couldn't tell for certain where the terrible heavy fire was coming from. It most seemed as though it was coming from everywhere. That's a dramatic reading of Alvin York's own words, his description of the conditions in which he saved the All-American Division. So to set the stage here, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bacino, the historian for the 82nd Airborne Division, explains what the conditions were like for the 82nd Division on October 8, 1918. At this point, the 82nd was committed to the Meuse-Argonne Offensive and specifically to the Argonne Forest, the eastern part of the Argonne Forest in France. This was fresh fighting in this forest. The forest was largely untouched by war's ravages. It was uh, tough terrain, marshy, hilly terrain, and, and dense forest in some places. And the ground and the trees and the wildlife had not been beaten up with artillery like many other parts of the Western Front. So in, in some places that made it harder to move. And so where we were in the war, 1.2 million Americans fought in the Meuse-Argonne. This was the biggest battle of the war for American forces. And the, the American expeditionary forces had 20,000 casualties every week. The All-Americans had a rough go of it, relatively. We talked in earlier podcasts about how Eben Swift, the first commander of the 82nd, focused on foot marching and singing before the division deployed. Well, he should have been focused on moving and shooting. The 82nd was not trained at the level of its German opposition, and a lot of that falls at the feet of Eben Swift and his replacement, Major General William Burnham, the second commander of the division. Across the Western Front, the Germans were getting smoked. The war ended, if you think that the think about it, the war ended on November 11th, 1918, a little more than a month after this incident. So it was coming to a culmination point. But the Germans were disciplined and they were well trained on machine gun fire and they had a fighting spirit. So our boys, the All Americans, were on the eastern side of the Argonne Forest and a few days before this, the 77th Liberty Division attacked on the west of the Argonne with nine companies, and they were overwhelmed and besieged by German forces. These nine companies from the Liberty Division are historically known as the Lost Battalion, and there are many books you can read, articles you can read about the Lost Battalion. But the Lost Battalion was surrounded for five days, and, and how they got in this position is another long fog of war story, but suffice to say that the Lost Battalion had no chance to fight their way out at least not on their own. And American artillery fire was, was firing short and, and falling short and killing members of the Lost Battalion, and that contributed to the chaos. So before we get into the sequence of events, it, it's important to note here that the 82nd, 
our All-American Division was facing a critical moment in world history. The fate of millions was converging at the feet of our men in a remote forest in France. For decades, what happened after that has been in dispute. Many historians, detractors, revisionists, and even York's fellow soldiers question the official version of events, the version of events that led to President Wilson approving the Medal of Honor for Sergeant York. So before we describe what happened, let's explain how we know, with absolute certainty, the full sequence of events. Colonel Douglas Mastriano wanted to find the truth of the York story. Mastriano is an active duty colonel who holds a PhD and serves at the U.S. Army War College. Colonel Mastriano is really the country's foremost expert on the matter. He spent more than 10 years writing the final word on Sergeant York, the 2014 book Alvin York, a new biography of the hero of the Argonne. This podcast is not a substitute for the book, and when you have a chance, we recommend you read it. He did not care about opinion, only fact. So he spent more than a thousand hours reviewing official archives from the United States, France, and Britain. He then visited Argonne and spent about a thousand hours on the ground, conducting terrain analysis and matching the terrain with the known doctrine and tactics of the 1918 Germans in the forest. Mastriano did archaeology with metal detectors. He found artifacts, verified those artifacts, and conducted ballistic forensic analysis on them. Now the story of how he did all this research is pretty intense, and it could serve as its own podcast, but suffice it to say, this guy got to the bottom of this story. When we combine the historical records with the terrain analysis and the analyzed artifacts, the sequence of events is irrefutable. There is no longer any mystery about what happened. So, what did happen? Well, let's let the expert tell it. This is Colonel Douglas Mastriano in a presentation recorded at the Pritzker Military Library and Museum in Chicago on October 29, 2015. The entire explanation takes 14 minutes, but it's an important 14 minutes because he explains precisely what happens, how it happened, and where it happened. So here it is, the ground truth on the actions of Sergeant Alvin York in the Argonne Forest. The plan of attack is to take the 82nd Division and attack into the flank of the Argonne so you can get the Germans from behind. Now the Argonne Forest is rough terrain. It's so bad that to this day the French don't use it. It's just an ancient forest that's been there since Noah's days and it's rough. But I would say it does not look unlike the terrain that York used to hunt in in Pall Mall, Tennessee. So the plan of attack for the Americans is uh, on 8 October 1918 at 6 o'clock in the morning. There's going to be a fierce artillery barrage shooting against the German defenders and then the Americans can attack behind that barrage, sweep through the German line, and, and get behind the Germans and, and liberate the lost battalion. Now seeing this coming though, the Germans uh, the, the night before retreated from the lost battalion area to, to, to secure their flanks because they see the American attack coming and it's, they don't want to be cut off. So the lost battalion is saved, but York's guys have no idea. So at six o'clock in the morning, everyone's lined up near the French village of Chateau Cherie, and there's no barrage. And six, one, two, eight, nine, what do we do? We go over in a minute, and the battalion commander, who's, who's now is Major Tillman, we go over with or without a barrage. Great. So the men from York's battalion attack into the Argonne Forest without any preparatory fires. Now the German army was good at what they did. They've been at this for four years. They knew the Americans were coming. So they created a kill zone in the Argonne Forest. So what you have is a village of Chateau Chery with hills ju jutting up about 100 meters, a thick forest, and there's a dead space behind the forest, wide open, devoid of trees, and then you're back into the forest again. So several German regiments, 120th Landwehr Württemberg and 125th Landwehr Württemberg regiments were poised to, to destroy the Americans as they attacked into the valley. And sure enough, 610 the Americans attacked. The Germans let the Americans come into the valley and it was terrible. The York, York's unit is stopped dead in its tracks and they're suffering extremely high casualties. In fact, the highest casualty rate that this uh, regiment is going to suffer in World War I or World War II. And things are desperate. York's platoon leader is uh, Lieutenant Kirby Stewart from Florida. He's, trying to, he's out front leading his men. 
And while he's out front and gets halfway across that valley, a German machine gun shoots his legs out from underneath him, and he rolls over on his belly and crawls forward, waving his 45 in the air and, and cheering the men to catch up with him. The men try to reach him, but unfortunately, another spray of bullets hits him in the head and he's dead. And that's the situation. To make matters worse, German machine gun fires are complemented by German artillery fires that start plopping down amongst the ranks of men. It's terrible. Unbeknownst to York and the other Americans, there's two more German regiments being brought up for a full regimental counterattack to not only push the Americans back, but to secure the eastern flank of the Argonne Forest to drive the Americans back into the valley. It could not get any worse. Now, taking over the platoon with the death of uh, Lieutenant Stewart is Sergeant Harry Parsons from uh, New York City. And he uh, orders several of the squad leaders to, to try to get their men to sneak behind the German lines. And the squads include, include York's. So 17 men, including York, are, are, they see a cut in the valley. They move together as a mass and are making way for it underneath uh, five German machine guns. And as the German machine gunners are ready to open fire and kill every last man of those 17, that uh, artillery bar barrage the Americans are supposed to shoot starts plopping now, just in time providentially. So the Germans are ducking for cover as the barrage is hitting and as York and the other 16 Americans are making their way to the German rear. And they break through and they slowly meander, meander their lay, way behind the German lines and they get about a mile behind the line moving slowly they see a communications trench actually the border trench dug, dug in the 1600s and they move down that they come to a little stream they see two German soldiers with, with uh, sanitation uh, you know, red crosses on their arms and the soldiers have all these tin um, water buckets and they're filling them up in the stream and the German soldiers see these 17 Americans, they drop their buckets making a large clang and they run straight back to headquarters. The 17 Americans, including York, chase the two sanitation officers back to headquarters and they surprise about 70 German soldiers who are preparing for a counterattack. York and the 16 other Americans, they, they gather the prisoners together to get them to stand up and they're trying to force them together and the Germans are kind of dragging their feet because on the hill above are more, more machine guns, specifically a machine gun commanded by Lieutenant Paul Lipp. Now, Paul Lipp, now what's interesting here is you think about friendships. Now, these guys are, are Landwehr regiments I mentioned from Württemberg. So the 120th is from Ulm, Germany, and 125th is from uh, Stuttgart, which means it's like National Guard. And many of these officers have been together in the army for about a decade, well before the war began. So we're talking about close friendships here, really close friendships, always together on the annual maneuvers and what have you. So Paul Lipp is commanding the machine gun on the hill. He looks down to the meadow below, sees Americans and lots of German prisoners being squeezed together. And they yell in German, get down, runter. And the uh, Germans dive to the ground, the Americans say, what was that? <laughs> What's going on? German machine gun opens fire, killing six, wounding three. There's only eight Americans left, and they're squeezed in, laying on top, and with the German prisoners, trying not to get hit by the spray of bullets. Lieutenant Paul Lipp, the guy commanding the machine gun position, tells the machine gunners to keep the Americans suppressed, keep fire on them so they don't go anywhere, and he runs up the hill to try to find more infantry platoons to support the attack, because the machine gun's not very accurate. And in fact, some, some of the German soldiers were hit by the machine gun spray as well. So they're yelling in German, stop shooting, there's, there's Germans down here. And York said, you never heard such a racket. So York surveys the ground. He looks over to his right where his best friend and really his only true friend in the army was standing moments ago, Corporal Murray Savage, the only other practicing Christian in, in, in the uh, unit of enlisted, uh, enlisted soldiers. And York loved this guy. They used to pray together. They used to keep each other accountable. They used to study the Bible together. And he looks over, and Murray Savage was hit by so many bullets that it was, he was chopped up, and his body was spread across the meadow floor. It was awful. And he looks over and sees Sergeant Early, who was actually leading the 17 initially. He, he was hit by five rounds, and uh, Corporal Cutting was hit by several rounds. And York is the last non-commissioned officer left. What does he do? And in fact, he entered this fight saying, I'm willing to die for my country, but not kill for my country. What do you do if you're one of the guys serving with York? I don't want to be near him. He's going to be a bullet magnet. But York knows what to do in that instant of time. There's no rage, but he said, I had to stop the killing. And it's incredible. He runs up the hill now. Now look, he's down in the, va he's down in the, the meadow with, with about 70 German prisoners and seven other Americans huddled on the ground trying, to get, trying not to get killed by the spray of bullets that already killed six and wounded three. And he charges up the hill against a German machine gun. He runs up the hill, 
Now, look, this is, this is 1918, September. We've broken out of the four years of conflict. So there's not this chewed up ground. This is a thick forest. And York charges up the hill. He outflanks the German machine gunners. Now, the machine gun, the Germans, of course, like any soldiers, are using the terrain. And there's two sunken roads there that go back to the medieval times. And there's a machine gun in a lower sunken road with supporting riflemen shooting over their, the machine gunners' heads into the valley below. And they have to stand up to see the Americans because it's a steep slope into the meadow. So York hits the tip of the V where those two roads meet. You couldn't pick a better spot. And he picks off the machine gun crew, and then he starts shooting the infantrymen. And he's yelling for them to surrender, and they won't lay down their arms. And so he kills all 19 of them. He looks up the hill, and he sees Lieutenant Paul Lipp, the German officer that commanded the machine gun, returning with more German reinforcements, headed down the hill towards him. York needs to get back down to his men anyway. So he runs back down the hill. Passes behind another trench. Now it's another border trench, so it's a straight line trench dug, dug in the 1600s like the other one that came down. And that trench is occupied by about a dozen German soldiers underneath the command of Lieutenant uh, Fritz Endres. Now you think about it, the Germans are faced one way, and Fritz Endres happens to turn around and sees an American running behind him. So Fritz Endres orders to his men, bayonet attack, follow me, and he blows on his whistle so they could hear it above the din of battle. And so these 12 German soldiers. No problem with a bayonet attack, except the boss is running the wrong way. The Americans are out front, and you're running behind. What's going on here? York realizes he's being, he's being followed, so he, he drops his rifle, slides on his side, pulls out his Colt 45 automatic pistol, and starts shooting the enemy from back to front. It's an old hunting trick he learned, picking off turkeys. If you shot the lead turkey, the others would scatter, you'd get one bird. But if you're quick on the draw, you shoot back to front, you get the whole flock. And he's thinking, if I shoot the lead guy, everyone else is going to see him drop, and they're going to hide behind trees, and then I'm dead. So he's picking them off back to front. And wow, the last guy to fall is Lieutenant Fritz Endres. And York shoots. Now, we found the effects. But York, York apparently shoots him six feet away with his 45, hits Fritz Endres in the abdomen, blows out his abs, throws him backwards, and he's screaming in pain for help. Now, why did York enter the fight today because his, his best friend and his other friends, less or so, but his other American buddies. What happens next is interesting because it transcends cultures and nations and warring nations at that. The battalion commander who was captured early in the fight, remember those two sanitation officers, the first two the first aidsmen ran back to headquarters they, that whole started this whole thing. The, guy, the commander was Lieutenant, Lieutenant Paul Fulmer. Now, he's captured early on. He's laying down with a mass of troops. When York is fighting off the bayonet attack led by Fritz Endres, Fulmer is trying to shoot York with his Luger and misses every time. He shoots like I do, I think. God help him. And then his best friend is, is, is screaming for help, Fritz Endres. These guys have been in the Army together for a decade, really, 12, about 10 years together. And so taking his life in his own hands, trying to save his friend's life, Lieutenant Paul Fulmer walks over behind York, and he's standing in a firefight. He walks over to him and stands about 10 feet away and, and yells above the din of battle, English? You know, do you speak English? English? Now, Paul Fulmer lived in Chicago uh, around the turn of the century. We're in his hometown here. He spent some years here working on the railroad. And he went back home to, to serve in the Army. It was an obligation back then, and uh, he stayed. So in perfect English... Do you speak English? English? York turns around and says, no, not English. And Fulmer's like, what? American, R York replies. And Fulmer's like, good Lord, if you stop shooting, I'll make them surrender. So York pulls his 45 at him and looks at him and says, okay, do it. And Fulmer blows on the whistle, and the Germans under the command of Paul Lip on the hill above come down the hill. What do you do? You now have about 100 prisoners. You only have... Seven guys beside himself, so eight Americans, about 100 prisoners, and you're still pretty far behind German lines. So York and, and the other seven Americans are trying to squeeze the Germans together, plus they're picking up the wounded German officer and the other wounded Americans. Anyone wounded is coming out with them. And York doesn't even know where he is. So he asked the German officer which road should he take, because he saw two roads, the road by the stream where the German soldiers were with, with the water bottles and the road by the machine gun on the hill above. And Fulmer, he's not stupid. Just take that high road, because the high road is covered by German machine guns. And if you take the high road, we're going to capture these Americans, and we'll be good to go. And York, even though he's from the country, he's no bumpkin, because we'll take the other road. And so they work their way back to the road by the stream, start making their way towards the American lines, and they're now behind the 7th Bavarian Company underneath the command of Max Toma, a young, motivated officer 
and he sees the Americans and German prisoners marching behind him. So he yells to his men, Lieutenant Max Toma, en engineer commander, 7th Minor Company from Bavaria, and he tells his men, bayonet attack, follow me. And so they charge against the throng. And the problem is that York is standing behind Paul Lipp and Paul Fulmer. In fact, he has got Fulmer by the scruff of the neck with his pistol in his back. And Max Toma can't get a shot at the Americans. They're hiding behind the Germans. So York says, you better get him to surrender. And Toma won't surrender. They'll never capture me alive. And, and him and Fulmer are yelling back and forth. Finally, Toma, the Bavarian, says, all right, I'll surrender only if you take full responsibility. And, and Fulmer's like, of course, I take responsibility. Stop it. So now we have eight Americans, including York, with 132 prisoners, and they're making their way out of the valley. They make their way through the fire zone, where the Americans are being killed moments before. And Lieutenant Woods, the personnel officer for York's unit, sees this large group of Germans coming, and he's like, it's a counterattack. And he's gathering other soldiers together, trying to put a defense uh, against the Germans that got apparently attacking towards them. But York starts waving at them, like, oh, it's York. And, and then on top of all that, while York is moving the men across the valley, Germans think it's an American formation. Artillery starts plopping around them, so they have to run out of the valley. And thus is the York story. Sergeant York, Sergeant York, we will never forget Sergeant York. So that's the story, the whole story, the real story. In an incredible moment of war, a pacifist turned into an instrument of effective combat. Then off to war across the sea, goodbye to valleys green. I go to fight an enemy that I have never seen. The right to live in freedom so dear to everyone. I'll give my life in trying to exterminate the Hun. Act 2, Paul Mall. Sergeant York's story became a global phenomenon because of his actions in a remote hilly forest in France. But his story starts long before October 8, 1918. It starts in a remote hilly region of Tennessee, in the community of Paul Mall, right near the state line with Kentucky, where Sergeant York was born in a log cabin on December 13, 1887, and where he was raised by his parents William and Mary, in the Valley of Three Forks of the Wolf River in Pall Mall. Alvin was the third of 11 children. The Yorks were poor and in an impoverished area. William was a blacksmith and a renowned marksman and hunter. In his 1922 book, Sergeant York and His People, Sam Cowan talks about the people of the Valley of the Three Forks of the Wolf River, here in a passage read by Brett Downey. The Valley of the Three Forks of the Wolf is more than a fertile space between two mountain ranges. It is a rectangular basin of verdure and beauty in the glow of a southern sun, around which seven mountains have grown to their maturity. Generously, for uncounted years, this family of the hills has given to the valley the surplus products of their timbered slopes, and the Wolf River has gone through the valleys distributing the wealth the mountains brought in, brightening and adding touches of beauty here and there, ever singing as she came down to her daily task. The mountains and the river have worked unceasingly together to make the spot a place of comfort and beauty. So it was a sparse, rugged living, but it was an alluring, calm, pure part of the world. Lieutenant Colonel Bacino spoke with Colonel Mastriano about Alvin's early life, how his relationship with the Lord and William shaped his valorous actions, his entry into the war, and the days leading up to October 8, 1918. And when his, so when his dad passed away and Alvin York was the oldest of the boys still the, at the house, he took over the farm and he could not handle the pressure. This couldn't make it happen. So instead of working harder, trying to work with the community and those who were trying to help him out, he decided to, to go get drunk at the weekend and cause trouble and get in fights. And uh, things were looking bad for him for a couple of years. His mom was really worried that he was going to get killed. A neighbor girl caught his eye, Gracie Williams. But the only way he could see Gracie was to go to church because her dad was a strong Christian. So he'd go to church just to check out Gracie. And then while at a, at a revival service on 1 January 1915, he went forward and accepted that his life changed. And that, that side of the community rallied around him. And within a few months, he stopped drinking, and he was teaching Sunday school, leading choir, and his life completely changed. So much so, they made him the assistant pastor. And at that moment in time, York started working out his character muscle. So what am I talking about when I talk about this character muscle? 
every time we make a decision in our life, it either builds or takes away from our moral character. And York, through a steady application of trying to do the right thing, uh, in his heart became a warrior, became a man of honor. And so that's 1915. Just a few years later, he's going to find himself in the Argonne in the fight for his life. Uh, everything's, look, everything's looking bad for the 82nd Division. And then we have this mountain man, Alvin York, who takes charge. And he wins a great victory at this battle that has a strategic effect. So that's why since the 1980s, Alvin York's been a featured character in our, in our field manuals and our leadership manuals till to, to today. So we'll have to leave it there for the first of two episodes on Sergeant Alvin York. Next week, we'll cover Alvin's return from the war, his work in Tennessee, and his advocacy for World War II. We'll also talk to another Sergeant York. The All-American Legacy Podcast is produced by the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office. We have to thank the Pritzker Military Museum and Library for allowing us access to their archives and for doing so much to contribute to the country's understanding of its war heroes. We owe a debt of gratitude to Colonel Douglas Mastriano for his time and for his remarkable effort to tell this story. Thanks to Dave Roberts for allowing us to use the song, The Ballad of Alvin York. I'm Master Sergeant Patrick Malone. Thanks for listening to the All-American Legacy Podcast.